This is Lori. This is Silvio. From VoyageWriters.com, and you are listening to Travel Fuels Life. everybody and welcome to Travel Fuels Life, the show where we share stories, tips, and inspiration to help you live a travel lifestyle. I'm your host, Drew Hanish, and have you ever wanted to go to the Galapagos Islands? In fact, is it on your bucket list? Well, I've been hearing it a lot lately, and so I thought it was a great idea to find two people who have been to the Galapagos Islands to come in and share their stories with us, not only of what they experienced while they were on the Galapagos Islands, because there are lots of natural wonders and exotic creatures, but there's also a lot of strategic planning that needs to go into going to a place like Galapagos. It is a very fragile ecosystem, and they're doing a lot to protect it. So there's stuff we need to know before we would plan out a trip like that. So from my home here in Greenville, South Carolina, it's time to jump on the World Wide Web and get a connection going with Lori and Silvio from north of the border in the great white north of Canada. Not quite white yet, but anyway. Hey guys, how are you doing today? Hi Hello. Drew. How are you? Doing good. How are you guys doing? It's been a while since our meetup in Corning, New York last year. It has been almost a full year and lots of travel, both of us as well as you, I can uh, see. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. And, and Laura, you just got back from Vancouver, it looks like. Yeah, I was there uh, for uh, about five days and then I'm heading back again uh, next week. Wow. Do you go to Vancouver often or is this just a uh, once in a blue moon kind of trip? No, I, I go fairly often. My son is... Uh, uh, at uh, the university there he's doing his master's degree in engineering so i pop out whenever i can uh for a visit i love it out there absolutely love it out there so it's uh, a good place to go and then i uh, have two stepsons that were also out there one is still out there so i try to combine as many trips and family visits as possible and when silvio can work around his schedule and join us it's even better very nice. And Silvio, you were on a red eye down to Mexico City, so I hear. Are you a full-time commercial pilot? Yes, I am. Uh, I work for Canada. So, uh, yeah, that was part of my job. I just came back uh, yesterday. Okay. And you were in the Canadian Air Force, correct? Yeah, 25 years and four days, to be precise. Okay. Because uh, we're, we're going to TPEX again this year in Billings, Montana, and I, I understand that you may be flying in there. I mean, I, when people say I flew in there, that usually means that, you know, there's a pilot flying us in. But it sounds like you're doing the flying. Yeah, it'll still be a pilot flying us in. But in this case, it'll be me. So it'll be uh, flying our own little airplane into um, Billings. Well, that'll be fun. Oh, absolutely. Uh, the, the, uh, the view, the, uh, the, the sensation, the uh, mother nature never disappoints, put it that way. Mm. And uh, going to Montana, it's not going to disappoint either. Oh, absolutely. Uh, Montana is just incredible. And the last time that I went, there were so many places I wanted to go that I just didn't get a chance to. So I'm going to try to make up for that this time and see what I can see. But... Uh, Lori, you actually not only do VoyageWriters.com, you also have a radio show, so I understand. Yeah, I have a travel radio show called Maple on the Map. And it is just per uh, my perspective as a Canadian traveling around the world, but also having people who listen, which right now they do in over 100 countries, um, hear some about Canada, and hopefully they'd like to visit. Nice, very good. And so you're you're near the Toronto area, right? Uh, is it Kingston? Yeah, we're about three hours east of Toronto, so we're in a nice area. We're between, really between uh, Toronto, Ottawa, and Montreal. So it's a great location for uh, sort of getting around but we're also oh maybe what 20 minutes 30 minutes from the u.s border and and so what got you into doing travel writing 
Uh, well, for me, I've traveled or enjoyed travel all my life, and I was a school teacher for 30 years, and I always kept journals, um, used my travels to develop curriculum, etc. And then when I was retiring from 30 years of teaching, I still wanted to do something, and we actually talked about trying to find something to do together. And we both like to write, we both like to travel, we both like to take photographs, so it seemed like a good fit for the two of us. I retired, but he went from the military into commercial flying, so we actually took a travel writing course to see if this would be of interest. And actually, within about two weeks of the course, we had our first joint article published and uh, sort of gone on from there. And so what's the focus of your writing? Because I, I see that your site says that you're not necessarily about traveling on a budget, but more about traveling smart. Well, we look at using your hard-earned money to get the most out of your travel. So that's where we went with it, it's not budget, it's about traveling smart, was the fact that whether you spend $100 on something or $1,000 on something, you want to get the best value. Mm -hmm. And for us, when we travel, uh, we don't want to spend all our time when we get to a destination figuring out what we should do, where we should go. We do the prep, you know, we would give on our, in our articles, we give sort of an overview of things to do. That way, if you're going to plan a trip or you're going somewhere, you've at least got a good idea to start. And if you, in fact, are not ready to travel for various reasons, um, even just reading a little bit about a place might take you away for just a you know, little bit of your time. Right. So part of it is the organizers, organizational and the other part is, look, uh, we can even travel from base, from home, for instance. So it's all about uh, what is best for an individual. Some people like a little bit uh, tighter budget. Some people have a little bit wider budget. In our case, we try to just make it the best value for the buck, basically. Very nice. And so this leads in nicely into Galapagos because I, I feel like, Galapagos is not the kind of place that you can just go, hey, let's go to Galapagos this weekend and see what it's all about. It's like there, there's got to be some preparation for this trip. And, and you guys uh, have gone recently, and I've had a lot of people asking me questions about it. And I definitely have some interest in going there as well. But it's kind of a bit of a, a mystery for us travelers who – have gone to the destinations like Europe where we don't have to deal with visas and uh, all of, all of the, that kind of stuff. And, um, and Galapagos is kind of its own self-contained national park. So, um, so I thought this would be great since you guys just went to have an opportunity to ask you some questions about it and get a feel for your experience as well and how you planned all of this out. So what, what was the thing that drew you to Galapagos as, as a destination? Well, certainly everybody's heard about, you know, Galapagos and how unique it is and how bio, but still how biodiverse it is. And we were looking at places that are around the world that because nature is changing, the environment is changing, what if we waited another 10 years and it wasn't the same or you couldn't travel there anymore? Mm. Um, that, that took us actually to Peru two years ago to Machu Picchu because we'd heard rumors that, uh, you know, it was becoming damaged, that they were going to reduce the number of people going, et cetera. So we thought, why not go now? Um, we love Europe. Uh, we love Canada. Those places are going to be there, but maybe the Galapagos won't be. So that was a bit of a push. And Silvio's parents are world travelers. They are fabulous travelers, and they were both turning 75. And they thought that it would be a fabulous trip for us to all go for their 75th birthday mm. and their, uh, what was it, 50, 55th. 55th wedding anniversary wow so uh we combined all of that together and decided to go 
to Gal you know, we did Galapagos and the mainland of Ecuador as well. So we were uh, 12 days total, but we were um, three days in the Galapagos itself. Was the the wildlife and the plant life all you expected it to be? It was beyond that, absolutely beyond that. We both knew that it was going to be terrific, but it was beyond anything that, um, you know, you hear the cliche about, oh, it was much better in person. I mean, the pictures are great. You can't even, you know, really grasp it until you are there mm -hmm. and see see what happens there and of course they're very very controlled and in, in how many people they allow and what type of activities and it at least to us seemed very evident they're doing a very good job at the controlling of that mm -hmm. it was a an experience a once in a lifetime experience would we like to go back absolutely um the different things but boy, we got a phenomenal overview, even just the three days we were there. Uh, of all the things that you saw there and then wanting to go back and, and see more, I, I, I can imagine that it's, uh, I mean, with three days, you kind of feel like, man, I need much more than this to do that. How, how long do you think somebody should plan to be in Galapagos? Well, depending on how you do it, because there's a, number of different ways you can do the basically the land tours with day trips uh to different islands or you can do some of the tours where you're living on a boat for uh you know for a period of time and sort of three days for us because we were with specialists and we were going morning noon and night everything was planned everything was organized there was no waiting for this waiting for that we were able to do a lot in those three days they do recommend at least five because of course you've got your travel days on on either end uh five to seven okay uh would be a good number what do you think so yeah, something like that, uh, absolutely. And it's also a different way to look at the islands. You can look at it on on the absolutely uh, beautiful biodiversity you have there, but also you can look at the historic aspect with uh, the, the story of Darwin coming there and, and finding out uh, the, the beginning of his theory of evolution and stuff like that. So there's different ways of looking at it and there's different ways of visiting the islands. And so did you guys tend to be on boats when you were going between the islands or did you, did you island hop a, a decent amount or did you take planes? How did you do that? We flew because uh, Galapagos itself does not have any customs or immigration there. So you have to go into Ecuador first. So we flew from Guayaquil in Ecuador to uh, Baltra, Galapagos Islands. And from there, it was either boat or small bus. Mm, okay. And everything is guided, I'm sure. I mean, it's it seems like I, I'm such a free spirit and want to roam around wherever I want to go, but it sounds like you're pretty much uh, locked into always having a guide with you. Yeah. You ha must have a Galapagos National Park guide with you when you're going on some of the um, – smaller uninhabited islands mm -hmm. but on the main island um once you've paid your tourist visa and your uh, galapagos national park entrance fee so mm -hmm. the first one the tourist visa is 20 dollars uh us dollars and the second one is a hundred us dollars and there's no question you have to have those you have no choice uh you can then stay on the main island there's lots to do there. That's where the uh, Charles Darwin uh, Center is. There's um, the uh, what the Galapagos Tortoise Reserve. You can do all that and not leave that main island. But if you are going out to any of the other islands, the only way to get there is by boat, and you must have a certified guide with you. And so, did you? How many of those other islands did you go to on your trip? Did you have time with the three days? Uh, yeah, we went to um, North Seymour, right? Mm -hmm. And we went to Baltra. Uh, well, Balter is where we initially landed. Yeah, yeah. and uh, the main island where we stayed most of the time was Santa Cruz. Oh, and which was your favorite? 
Oh, wow. oh geez. <laughs> <laughs> reasons. Give you the tough oh, one. Like picking a favorite child. Right. Yeah, no, it's for, for very different reasons. Uh, they were all fantastic. The island of Santa Cruz is also where the, the biggest town is, uh, Puerto Ayara. I think I pronounced it probably. Uh, it's surprisingly, uh, it's a town of about 20,000 people, surprisingly enough. And that's, uh, that's where we were based off a beautiful little uh, hotel resort called Finch Bay. And it's actually uh, listed in one of the uh, general um, National Geographic unique largest in the world. Okay. And yeah, is that, uh, that's an interesting de- designation that I've never heard of before. So they actually have just picked out uh, a series of hotels to highlight as just being exceptional is it exceptional for where they're placed, or is it just because that is just an incredible hotel all the way around? Well, it, it's part, yes, certainly be where it's placed, but it's also because it's considered an eco lodge. So mm-hmm. everything they do there is very purposeful as far as dealing with waste, um, just even the structure of the lodge. And for us to get there, we had to take um, what they call a panga, which is actually a water taxi, but it was a private one that belonged to the hotel. So they picked us up at the wharf in uh, Puerto Eora, and then, I don't know, we were about a 10-minute ride over to another dock, got out, and we had to walk about 10 minutes to get to the lodge. It's a very private lodge, Uh, the type you'd, you'd... picture with the hammock on the deck and all that sort of stuff it was uh was pretty amazing and wildlife all around uh incredible sunsets incredible food and uh very laid back which was quite nice so did you see the sea tortoises and the and the sea lions and the rest we absolutely did we had two different days of of tours both by boat to um, different islands where we were led by one of the naturalists that were assigned to us for the whole three days. So we had actually two naturalists that were specifically for us. Uh, We were a group of 14 total and they stayed with us for the three full days and did all of the activities with us. Mm. Uh, And one of the, one of the great ones was uh, going out to the North Seymour Island and Finch Bay Lodge, where we stayed, has its own private yacht. It's a 60-foot yacht with a chef and bathrooms and showers and the whole bit, and that was ours for the day. So they picked us up and took us out to uh, North Seymour Island, where we were were the ones that were on display, not the animals. Uh They just, it was unbelievable. I mean, you, you keep an observational distance, that's the phrase. Mm-hmm. And, you know, obviously not a fence, not anything. This is their environment. We are the visitors. And they just literally look at you and they don't run away. They just stay where they are doing what they do in nature. And to see, uh, you know, the world famous blue footed boobies mm-hmm. and the, um, what were the scarlet? The frigates. The frigate. Magnificent yeah. frigates. Yeah, with the massive red throat that blow that they blow up into a great big balloon uh, during mating and to see the land iguanas and the sea iguanas uh, it was we were all hushed we hardly said anything as we walked we were <laughs> just such awe yeah. of uh, nature you can basically stand as close as about a, a meter to two meters away I mean it's mm. incredible yeah that's the close they don't really the, the naturalists <laughs> will caution you if you are too close. And there is a, a, a gravel, not a gravel, but it's a dirt path that you must stay on. And quite honestly, some of the wildlife enjoys the path too. So you have to just <laughs> stay put until they move. <laughs> so if you're going around in these little 14 people groups, then I, it just does. I mean, I see pictures of tourist destinations where it's just bumper to bumper people and it's kind of frustrating these days to go to popular destinations and and have that happen but it it sounds like it's a a lot more controlled there oh very very much even to the point where um when we landed at the airport uh the Baltra airport 
there are a couple of different control stations right there at the airport before you can even leave. Mm -hmm. um, you can't have any dirt on your shoes. Um, it's a complete non-plastic uh, island. So you can't have plastic bags. If, if they And they will look through your luggage. If you have plastic bags, those plastic bags are gone. You can't have non-recyclable um, plastic of any type. Uh, very, very controlled, and the fines are huge. Mm. You can't bring in food. Um, what else? Yeah, like you, you have to check underneath your, your shoes, your luggage everywhere. If there's any, any little stones, anything that's sticking to it, you have to get rid of that before you get to the island. And they control the number of people also, which is nice because you, you kind of need to to be able to preserve the, uh, the fauna and the, uh, the vegetation. <laughs> Where did you learn about all of this stuff? Because I can imagine that a lot of people show up probably with all of this stuff in their luggage and then all of a sudden are in panic mode trying to figure out what they're going to do with all their stuff. Yeah, well, I mean, we were, you know, I read. I'm a voracious reader. So even just when we discussed going to Galapagos, I wanted to know everything there was to know. So I picked up, uh, you know, the Lonely Planet book. I looked online and because we chose to go with a tour company, we went with some uh, company called Gate One Travel. Um, they were very good about passing on that information. Mm -hmm. um, you know, now obviously you have to read. So uh, we knew that, but I, I, I just, I'm very, you know, do did we need visas? Do we need you know, what did we need? So I looked for a lot of things. And the one that was very interesting is that they won't let you on the airplane to get to uh, the Galapagos without in hand proof that you have uh, health insurance. Ah, okay. Which apparently is fairly new. So, uh, I mean, they have a very different. Um, infrastructure there obviously i mean the, the uh, main town there has uh, uh, approximately twenty thousand people that's the largest after that you're looking at uninhabited islands or islands that have you know just a scattering of people so their infrastructure as far as dealing with people with medical issues is is semi-limited so they're uh, they it's really well thought out i have to say um in you know, when you're looking at Galapagos versus the actual mainland Ecuador, unbelievably different, yet considered the same country. Yeah. So with the health insurance, uh, you're not speaking of just, I have my own home health insurance, but I have some kind of travel health insurance that's yes. going to yeah. carry yeah. along with me. Did your agency help you take care of that or did you kind of do that on, on your own? Well, we're the type of people, because we travel so often, we have an annual um, health insurance plan through uh, Allianz Insurance, but when we purchase tours, and this one um, cost us, I think it was 3700 so 3700 US each, but that included um, flights from yeah, Toronto, all of our flights, most of our meals, all of our accommodation, all of our activities, um, we always add on the travel slash um, health insurance with the company. It's mm -hmm. minimal. You know, we spend $3,700 each. If something happens, you want to know that, you know, if you have to cancel that you're getting your money back. But also the health insurance. I'm one of those people who thinks you can't have enough because the cost of things are astronomical. So that's just for us, it's, it's literally insurance and peace of mind. So we always include that in every trip over and above sort of our regular annual plan. Yeah. Now, you know, for me, I think the trips that I've taken in the past when I was being frugal and I didn't have a lot of money and I wasn't traveling at the amount that I am now, I didn't really think about getting health insurance when I was traveling out of the country or getting trip insurance because I thought, well, especially if I find a really good fare somewhere, sometimes I'm sitting there thinking, well, you know, do I really need to or not? But it seems like the more you travel, the more you start to see the value in these things. 
Absolutely. And the more horror stories you read, and I'm thinking, I don't want to be one of those statistics. So (laughs) that's just, uh, that's included in what we're going to spend on our trip. So you're kind of answering one of my questions, which is spending money, because I'm thinking when I get down there, you know, do I have to have cash in my pocket? And if I do, what kind of cash do I take with me and how easily accessible is cash? But did you feel like you just didn't really even need to have money in your pocket because food and activities and all that are taken care of? Yeah, most of it was taken care of. So we didn't really need much cash. The only thing we needed is for the uh, the tip towards the uh, the guides uh, towards the end. And so what kind of currency did you work with? It, U.S. dollars. Okay, so you're not getting Ecuadorian money. No, no, U.S. dollars. Now, that is a, a consideration uh, because you are, especially when you're going to Galapagos, there are not going to be an abundance of um uh, bank machines or banks everything there is done by satellite so they're uh, they really discourage credit cards and debit cards because their connections aren't always terrific so cash is king there it mm-hmm. works well and there are a couple of ATM machines uh, yeah you, uh, but the other thing is you don't need to go with you know a thousand dollars in cash in your pocket if you pre-book your hotels, even if you did it on your own, pre-book your hotels and some of your excursions before you even leave. Uh, they can be a bit more expensive that way, especially the excursions, but you know you've got them and you know they're they're paid for. Um, if you do any research into travel planning for Galapagos, people do find it very, very expensive. Mm-hmm. Um, and you you know you need to know how to get around because it's not like there's a massive transit system there uh there are hotels but only in certain locations that's why we let somebody else do all the work and Uh we literally just went and enjoyed it and we were you know we travel on our own like we you know we travel through europe where we do all the planning we do all the driving etc in this case we thought you know what this is a specialized place we're going to go with a tour company that has a good reputation, and it didn't let us down. I mean, we were not even rushed on this trip. We had downtime. They built downtime in so that, for instance, at the Finch Bay Lodge, the, they had a pool area, which was inhabited by ducks occasionally, <laughs> <laughs> looking out over this beautiful mangrove um, area with a cup of coffee and my writing material. Like life doesn't get better than that. (laughs) Right. Awesome. Too bad you can't do it all the time. Right. But uh, who's got the $3,700 to do that over and over. (laughs) Exactly. Now, remembering that that $3,700 covered the Galapagos and doing a mainland Ecuador, all, you know, flights, et cetera. So uh, that was an all in that covered a lot of, lot of um, stuff. That's 12 days. Yes. Yeah. Yep. And that was the flight starting from Toronto also. Yeah, I, I definitely can see that. I mean, yeah, because I do these trips planned out in grabbing a hotel here and a hotel here and a hotel here and then paying for my airlines and doing this over a span of months before I go on a big trip. I don't know that I ever, I, I, I hate to admit this, but I don't know that I ever actually see what the total cost for my trip is by the time it's done and it wouldn't surprise me if i probably get up into maybe not that range but not far from it and you're going to a amazing place like galapagos that is uh you know a once in a lifetime kind of an experience for a lot of people yeah exactly when you think about it just a flight from guayaquil to uh balta and galapagos that's that's over 600 miles away so that takes well over an hour with uh, with an airbus yeah. So there are people who are probably going to try to do this on the cheap. And I've heard uh, a couple of suggestions of ways of going and doing some last minute deals for cruises and, and things like that. Um, with your trip having happened as smoothly as it has, do you think those people should rethink that? Or do you think maybe that's something worth in investigating and you know, for the person who really doesn't mind doing 
a lot of extra legwork to try to figure all of this stuff out that, that it would be feasible and they wouldn't get into trouble doing it. Hmm. That's good consideration. Uh, you know, these people, the, the group, we went through our the expert and they have group rates and stuff like that. So you might be able to get it a little bit less expensive if you do it on your own, but the difference in price and the amount of work you're going to have to do and the risk of uh, something not going the way you, you planned. Uh, I'm not sure if it's it's worth it. Like I said, we our site is based on trying to get the most for your dollar, not necessarily going the cheapest way, mm -hmm. but what you get is what you pay for, basically. One of the things that a lot of people do is um, they go down and they take one of the boat tours where you're actually living on the boat for three or four days. Mm -hmm. Because Galapagos has two seasons, um, the what was the date? The January to May can be is warm but quite rainy, and then the June to December is cool and dry. Um, the weather can still be inconsistent, and I do I have read sorry about people that have been on the boats and it's been rough. Mm. For me, that does not make for a good stay. You know, each day we were on a boat, but at night we were back on the land. Um, so, you know, those are added logistics. If you're going on one of the tours where you're staying on the boat, then that's sort of all dealt with together. You've got your side activities, but you know where you're staying, and that's partly your transportation. So certainly a lot of considerations. And in this case, I think with Galapagos, and just personal opinion, there's a lot of extra considerations to that trip as opposed to going somewhere else. And, and, and what time of the year did you go? We went in uh, early November. And again, personally, I don't think the weather could have been one iota better. It nice. was amazing. It was warm, but not brutally warm. And the water was a fabulous temperature. Um, the one thing, though, that we did notice when we landed was that on uh, Baltra itself, it looked like a barren desert wasteland with trees that were dead. And mm. I'm thinking, I, I know it's on volcanic soil, but what is this? We asked our naturalist, and he said, oh, you just wait. Within a couple of days of rain, this whole island comes together, and it <laughs> bursts with life and there's flowers everywhere okay that amazing and then we moved to uh, Santa Cruz Island and it's lush and blooming and I'm thinking this is your dry season <laughs> that's, so, that's the, interesting uh, yeah the airport's on the north side of it's on the lee of the uh, side of the, the mountain of the uh, volcano and uh so the water, the humidity is stopped, is stopped by the physical feature of, of the volcano. So it's dry on the north side, but very lush and green on the south side. So it's, it's just by doing that hour and a half drive from the airport to uh, Puerto Ayora, uh, you, you see from like almost a desert area to a jungle area. It, it's quite different. It's, it's very unique. That's, you know, what's funny about that is the islands, you know, if you go to Hawaii and you go to the big island of Hawaii, you get that same effect because you have those two large mountains in the middle of the island and one side is tropical and the other side looks like a desert in some spots. Exactly. Or it's, yeah. it's, it's, think of that, but even more dramatic. Oh, yes. They say there really isn't a bad time to go to the Galapagos. You just need to do your, you know, research and find out, you know, the way you like to travel and what you like to do and see. Uh, because you're still going to see 99% of all of the wildlife all year long. Mm -hmm. But I would imagine that during heavy tourist seasons, especially, you know, middle of summer, you're probably going to be looking at more waiting lists. Ah, that's a good question. I don't know. Because because it's a place that people can travel to 12 months of the year, um, we were coming up to the beginning of the, um, 
the wet season. No, I mm. know we were. I guess we were sort of in the middle of the cool, dry season. It's so regulated. I don't know if there's a, um, a a part of the year where it's massive tourism. It's just not something that's so frowned upon down there. Yeah. It's uh, it's very close to the equator, so the summer, the winter is almost the same as far as temperature and stuff like that. It, there is a drier season and a wetter season, a little bit of a temperature change, mm-hmm. but it is very close to the equator. Yeah, and this is my inexperience traveling not only to the equator, but south of the equator is trying to get the seasons in my head and figure out when is the best time to go there and what is the, but, but that makes sense. You're, you're right in the middle of the globe, so the, the swings are not going to be that great. No, no, they seem to be. Where it gets affected the most, actually, is El Nino's. Mm. That affects the, uh, the weather there. But then El Nino may last a few months to, to a year, right? Yeah. So um, on from Galapagos, where do we head to next? I know when we were at Tebex and we were having dinner that one night, we talked about uh, Antarctica, which is another one of those spots that I think you just really have to – do a lot of research and probably going with some kind of a, uh, uh, an agency is probably the, the better way to go. Do you have, uh, you have any more wild and crazy trips like that coming up or more kind of standard fare stuff? Well, what we're doing to Montana, but we're flying our own small planes. So we've got some little side adventures as we go down there for the almost, I guess, almost two weeks total. Uh, and then in November, we're heading to Thailand. Mm, okay. First time? It's our first time in Thailand. So we're really, really looking uh, looking forward to, to that as well. So doing research on what extra things we want to see in Montana and what else we want to do in Thailand and get a little background in history. So those are the two main ones coming up. And we've got... Uh... Yeah, in two years, we're also um, doing a couple of weeks in South Africa. So we're already, we've already got the safari and everything's all booked. So now we're just working on sort of the other ends of the, of that week of safari with uh, some time in um, Cape Town and doing a few other things. So, so is this a, a first trip to Asia and a first trip to Africa or have you been to either one before? Uh, I've been to uh, Japan and Singapore. Um, I actually lived in Singapore for, or stayed in Singapore for four months. Um, Silvio? I've been to the Middle East, so that's part of Asia. Uh, yeah. But I've never been to the Far East. And okay. also in Africa, I've been to the uh, north, north part of Africa, like Egypt, but I've uh-huh. never been to some. Yeah. Okay. And for me, uh, this will be my first uh, trip to Africa. Fun, fun new adventure. So, uh, is this a conquer all seven continents plan? <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> Get it done, right? Yeah. When I was in the Air Force, I've been to the Arctic, uh, to the far, well, pretty close to the North Pole, and now I want to go to Antarctica. So. <laughs> <laughs> I saw a YouTube video, and I'll have to hunt it down, but I saw a YouTube video of some guys that were flying a, around the world in a small plane, and uh, it was interesting to watch because they videoed a lot of it, and they picked somebody up, and they took them from Montreal to Paris on that leg of their flight, and they were when we were talking about you and your great view that you have flying a plane – just looking at what they got to see while they were flying over North Quebec and up in that area is just absolutely beautiful and something that I've never seen before because it seems like every time I'm flying to Europe, it's always on a red eye and yeah, it's exactly. always dark by the time I get to that area. So have you flown up in, in that area before? Yeah. Oh, yeah, many times. Uh, and the Arctic is so beautiful. The air is pristine, the visibility is amazing. Uh, and the, the interesting thing is, if you want to far in the far north, the far uh, the high Arctic, uh, there's no trees. Mm. So the only thing you have is a little bit of uh, small uh, plants, lichen, and, uh, and this, the vegetation, the environment is so rugged. Yeah, You can see a boulder. You don't have any perspective for distance. You can see a boulder and think, oh, it's only about a quarter of a mile away. And you start walking for it, and you find out that it's five miles away. <laughs> it, it's incredible. 
it's just incredible. I think everybody should see that and have a bit of perspective for the uh, how important the environment is. Yeah, I I saw the, these guys landed in Baffin Bay, and I just uh, I was surprised at how many people lived up there. There was a little town there, and they had enough to you know enjoy a night in the hotel and and do stuff. And you just kind of forget that there are cultures and people who actually survive up in these these terrains. Yeah, survive and thrive. Yeah, amazing, amazing. Well, I, I appreciate you guys uh, jumping in on the show this week and, and, and filling in the gaps on Galapagos because I know a lot of people are, are interested in that. And, um, you know, so I think, I think we got a lot of good information there for them. And you're going to be posting pictures from that coming up very soon, so I understand. Oh, absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. I have, uh, I just have a new article up on uh, the website uh, about Ecuador itself. Uh, and then uh, just getting ready to publish one just on the Galapagos. And I will tell you, it will be a massive challenge to pick which pictures to include <laughs> because it is a photographer's dream down there. Uh, I can imagine. What what kind of, do you uh, do like me and take your cell phone with you because it takes such uh, good pictures or do you take more of a professional camera with you when you go? Um, I, I take, I have a Canon DSLR that takes phenomenal pictures and my, um, uh, iPhone, which also takes phenomenal pictures. So, um, I spend a lot of time with my eye in the camera. I will uh, admit that. <laughs> um, the, the one thing is I did not bring my telephoto lens because uh. I was told that, uh, the animals are so close that you don't need to, um, you know, and it is a bit heavy. You know, there were maybe once or twice I thought, oh, I wish I'd had my telephoto lens with me. But for the rest of the time, I didn't need it. And also a good waterproof camera, like a GoPro or something else, when you're snorkeling and you see the, um, I think they're black tip sharks and the beautiful seagrass and the hawksbill tort uh, turtles, unbelievable. Mm -hmm. um, so, yeah, as I said, I, I'm going to be hard-pressed to pick <laughs> which pictures to <laughs> We've done nice. snorkeling. I've done snorkeling a uh, number of places around the world, and that by long shot was the best snorkeling I've ever ever done. I mean, there was one time we saw not one, not two, but four huge sea turtle at the same time. Mm. Uh, fish that are like over a foot long. <laughs> uh, one of the sea turtle actually, which just got up, stopped uh, grazing, and is started up and was moving towards us. We had to move out of the way to be able to let oh, it go. Wow. <laughs> <laughs> for, for a guy like me, who's never snorkeled before, I'll, I'll get spoiled if that's my first experience. <laughs> oh yeah. yeah we, I, we both came out on boat and it's just a, wow. That was amazing. That's, that's wonderful. So tell me, uh, tell me how people can keep up with, uh, your, your photos and the stuff that you're doing and trips you're taking, including Thailand and all that, uh, websites, uh, social media, best place to, to reach out for you. Well, um, our website is voyagewriters.com mm -hmm. and on all social we're voyage writers. And okay. if anybody wants to listen to the, uh, the radio clip, Maple on the Map, it's on popcanradio.ca. It's a, it's a streamed radio, and it's, as you said, it's listened to in over 100 countries uh, with the all Canadian music and then my travel, uh, my travel clip. Perfect. It's way writers with uh, writers with an S because there's two of us. Okay. <laughs> Excellent. I will put all of the links onto the show notes page at travelfeelslife.com. Uh, and then people will be able to just click and follow and check out what you're doing. And I, I really appreciate your time today and I'm looking forward to seeing you guys and catching up in Billings, Montana when we all get there. So it's, uh, it's, it's been fun following you guys for the last year and looking forward to catching up in the future. Looking forward to see you there. Uh, can't wait. Well, I hope you enjoyed the conversation today with Lori and Silvio and you got some good information about Galapagos. I've got a little bit more for you. If you go out to travelfuelslife.com slash podcasts and then look for show number 33, 
That is this episode. And on the show notes page, I've got a link to a government website for the Galapagos Islands. And it's going to give you eight things that you need to know to be able to get to Galapagos and not have any kind of issues when you are traveling there, especially if you are planning this out by yourself without the help of an agency. So check that out. It is at travelfuelslife.com slash podcasts, episode 33. So do you like whiskey? You like history? You like travel? Well, check out my new webpage. It's devoted completely to whiskey travels and sign up for the newsletter to make sure that you find out when the new Whiskey Lore podcast is going to be hitting your favorite podcast app. All you have to do is go to whiskey-lore.com. That's whiskey-lore.com. Something new and exciting coming from Travel Fuels Life. And until next time, have a great week. And thanks for listening to Travel Fuels Life. Uh, just to give you an idea for the sea lions, they are everywhere. everywhere. Uh, one time we were waiting on the dock to, uh, for the panga, there was a taxi boat. And there was two benches. One bench had two sea lions. And my brother-in-law was sitting in the bench next to it. So one of the sea lions sort of grumbled and moved the other one. And the second sea lion just went towards the bench, basically moved my brother-in-law out of the way so he could have the bench. <laughs> That's oh, how intimate the, the, the animals are. I mean, yeah. they are absolutely not afraid of people. Wow. <laughs> that is crazy. Uh, did, yeah. And you didn't get video of that, unfortunately, I'm guessing. No, <laughs> no, 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 it was just... a few pictures yeah. on the move. Yeah. Like my brother-in-law, when he saw the sea lion coming over, yeah. <laughs> just about to move him, he just moved out of the way. That's crazy. Yeah. Oh, excuse me. <laughs>